And we're live. Well, hello. It is 2020-11-29. This is episode 34 of Lucid Indifference. That's lucidindifference.com. We took a bit of a break. Our last show was on uh, November 11th. And uh, we took a bit of a of a vacation, a bit of a break, uh, for a few reasons. So, Minion, you were playing League of Legends, is that right? Yeah, there was a League of Legends hosted tournament. What do you mean by posted? Hosted. Hosted? Oh, okay, so it was like an official thing. And uh, you had mentioned it before that it had... It happens every now and then. The rewards are just in-game. It's just in-game rewards. I'm getting an awful buzz from you when you're talking. Has there been a problem with your headset? There shouldn't be. Is everything okay now? No, it's different. It's like, um, in audio, there's something called a ground loop, which can't apply to you because you don't have... It's not traditional hardware or anything, not really. Um, But I'm hearing a consistent kind of buzzing, which is very strange for you. Are Are all your cables okay? Did you swap? They them? should be, or is it still buzzing? Oh yeah, yeah. That's very strange. That sounds like a hardware problem that we can troubleshoot another time. I mean, I can probably noise remove it. Give me an open mic for like five seconds. No, I'm not getting anything. No, okay, so I don't know, maybe it's being introduced by Discord. That's really strange. No. Talk some more. No. It's uh it's all op- it's only happening while you're talking, which means that it's the, like, do you have push to talk set up in Discord as well? Oh. Mm-hmm. It is very strange. Okay, we're definitely going to have to look into that because I'm wondering if, because you were raiding as well, which which we should talk about, like, right now. So you you... You said 12 hours, to, so this is Destiny too. You said 12 hours of raiding. What was that like? Uh, not that I could notice right away, but I might not have been listening very carefully. So, not... Well, now it's good. Now it's just suddenly good. Okay, that's so that's Discord then. Oh, it's wireless, yeah? Whew. Okay, so you got like objects. Is it radio interference? They're actually uh, not... They're standard... This is, I don't know if you can call them laws, but but there are standards of some sort about radio interference of all of these electronic devices because... They used to be, I suppose they used to be a lot worse, but, uh, so, you know, if you've got a microwave running, stuff can get really weird in your kitchen, certainly next to your microwave, but this kind of thing, uh, yep. And, and now the buzzing is back. So you did something weird. You turn the program off. Now it just got better. <laughs> Ah, awesome. Technology's great. It's inconsistent. Well, I don't... I mean, this... You use that phrase too broadly. Well, very possibly. I know the push-to-talk, so the push-to-talk software we're using, I'd love to give you the name of it, but uh, it's gone. It's been abandoned. It's... It is... Yeah, the website does not exist. Uh, The developer has given up on the software. I happened... I don't know. It's amazing. <laughs> so the, the, I don't know. The developer, maybe the developer is deceased. Who knows? Right. And the domain name just expired. Um, this is one of those cases where uh, I would consider this a rather critical piece of software. It happens to work. It continues to work. It has a couple of, you'll never notice the issues, but I have noticed some strange nuances. Like when I exited, it's all my software might kind of get all confused. So I might have to relaunch Discord, for example, or I might have to open that software back up again and and close it again. And then it will actually unhook itself from the audio services or however it does things. But it just came back. Yes. Well, 
I mean, you can exit that software and see if see if it just kind of comes back to life. Because I I've heard weird problems before. I mean, whenever you've got a piece of software that's in the way between your voice and recording or streaming, uh, then that's an opportunity for that's a moving part, right? It's an extra opportunity for something to be wrong, something to break. And I I knew that this would be because so we've got. We've got a few f- few links in the chain between our voice and going out to Twitch. So this is for our lot live audience that's listening. And every single step in that chain could have some sort of push to talk service. And the only one that does is Discord. And it just ruined my audacity. <laughs> Did it? Yeah. Okay. So it stopped the recording, but um, well, yeah. Start it back up. We're gonna. We're. I will manually line up the sync. Just. To... Well, I it, I resumed it already, but Jesus, that program just kind of screwed with my headset. Oh. Okay. So you're using Discord push talk. No, I'll change it afterwards. But um... okay, you sound great now. Problem solved ish. Okay. I guess. Because I'm not muting on the thing. Um Oh no, problem not solved. I'll deal with it for now. Okay. <laughs> okay. I mean and be- and one of the beauties is because we've got two completely separate tracks being recorded distinctly. Uh one in this studio and the other in Minions Dungeon. Yeah. You're gonna have fun with plosives and a bunch of random spikes. I hope your editing turned out to be um, oh great. Well, well, or not plosives, but a bunch of gibberish. Well, yeah. So background noise. So what you've got now. So the setup you, that you have now. The reason that we had push to talk forced on you is that while so if you've got an open mic and you're and you're not speaking, and you're not speaking. The, it is listening to the room, it is listening to the world. It depends on its sensitivity and all this kind of stuff. It will pick stuff up. It'll pick, let's say, for example, it'll, it'll pick up traffic. And if it's picking up traffic, um, that that's terrible to listen to. It's terrible for people to hear live because the, the thing is, if you're talking and it's the traffic is only in the background when you're talking, your brain has this this thing where you're you're listening to the human and it kind of tunes out all the stuff that's unimportant and so it will not it, it's not that big of an impact having traffic but in the dead spaces between sentences the traffic will come will it's the only thing available so a person's ear will fixate on that and it might not just fixate on the traffic or the background noise or something like if you have a fan in the background it'll fixate on that and then that fixation will last, however temporarily, into the speaking. So it actually damages a person's ability to appreciate speaking. And uh, in this particular case, right right now, because I can't hear anything in your background noise, I have, I have monitoring, I have studio headphones on, and so I can hear pretty well. Uh, I don't, I don't hear anything when you're not talking. So I don't think it's going to be a problem at all. Um, you locally and audacity might be better than my ears but i have a feature in post-production in the audio engineering side of things so after the show is done we've got an actual recording on disc we're not going to take the stream as it's recorded on twitch and uh and just kind of like upload that to youtube uh we actually have it recorded locally and because it's recorded locally the audio engineering pass that i have does apply something called noise gating and um and gating is a feature that I've talked about before, where if the volume of the content of the audio is too low, it makes it lower. It's insult to injury. It drops it even lower. In my case, it's actually uh, very aggressive, and I have to make sure that it's not. So if a person talks so quietly, it that might not be loud enough, and it might just go, ah, it's not important, <laughs> and clip it out. And when it's done correctly, which I have done it correctly, um, it will soften breathing. It might, it'll eliminate most breathing. 
uh, and it'll eliminate background noise unless it's particularly loud background noise. Even then it'll soften it. And the reason I'm not even more aggressive is sometimes when a person is, um, you know, if different people are, are going to speak in their own unique way and a person can very frequently trail off at the end or have these inhalations at the beginning. And it's actually, it's bad technique, so to speak, but I can't necessarily train minion, obviously. And so a person might have an expressive uh, exhale or an expressive inhale that's fairly aggressive and that uh, really adds to the flavor of what's being talked about. And uh, plosives are, a, a, are an example of not having that. That's just poor technique. That's poor speaking. Now, and having the breathing that's, that's kept in there, um, there, so there's a double advantage. One is it won't clip off the end when a person speaks. It'll keep a little bit so that the breathing right at the end so that oh like r's i suppose r gets really soft at the end and if you're too aggressive with the engineering you can clip it off which just sounds terrible so i get both i get to keep the r's and i get to keep a little bit of the breathing but traffic and the light breathing that happens kind of between sentences if it's managed pretty well it will it'll just be <laughs> it'll be gone and in your case, Minion, what you've got is you've got a headset. And the nature of a headset is that it's, it's, a, it's more or less pointed directly at your mouth. And so you might think, oh, well, that's absolutely picking up my breathing. That's ridiculous. But it's a combination of the hardware in your headset, which is not cheap, and the the software chain that we have is there is um and discord is being forgiving about this it where it's actually got its own noise gating feature so it's not transmitting anything so our live people are not suffering from anything that's kind of quiet in the background of your voice now audacity is going to be picking up more but like i said i'm going to noise gate out that so i'm going to do the job that discord does what I used to do is I actually would look at waveforms and, <laughs> and I, I would learn, you know, you, you learn better at whenever you're doing something. I, I have said this before that when you've got some endeavor that you're interested in, just it's, it's not, you know, stand up on a stage, just do it. But honestly, just do it and realize that you're going to be about as fumbling and useless as some child and that it's okay because because you're just a tall child when you're doing something new and you're you're going to be terrible at it. it it's not some magical oh i've been interested in this for so long and i should now i just hop into it and i'll be okay <laughs> no no you're going to be terrible and at least you have to know that you're going to be terrible and you have to be comfortable with that. And this is why people should experiment with all kinds of stuff, you know, learning all kinds of things and everything is going to be kind of hard <laughs> until you're humbled by how bad you are at everything. And only when comfortable at that state, can you kind of, it's not even pushing through. It's just like apathy. Just, just don't care. It's, it's fine. And then take uh, as many opportunities as possible to, accept improvement because it'll just be handed to you on a silver platter more or less if you're doing something that a lineage of other humans have been doing for centuries really then uh among the other people who have become amateur-ish uh, there will be some people who will, will want to teach uh, even posthumously to leave documentation or just inspiration and you can be slightly arrogant about it and go, well, if that person can do it, I can, which, which is probably true for a lot of stuff. Um, just don't spread yourself so thinly and make sure that you've got a significant amount of attention on the one thing that you can actually take the opportunities to improve that have been given to you or that you discover and take that and fold it back in to make yourself better. And 
in this particular case, for the audio engineering stuff, I didn't know any better for so many things. And I knew, I knew it was going to happen. And it's one of these, well, we don't have a large enough audience for me to be particularly embarrassed. It's going to be us and some friends and, you know, it, and YouTube for all of time kind of thing, which, uh, yeah, what you going to do, right? And uh, I'm not too worried because the content of my, of the topics of, the, of what I'm saying is, is interesting enough, at least for me, that I'm not too worried that the audio quality isn't as good as it could be. It's a shame. It's a real crying shame, right? But, but at least it got done. Uh, at least it got done badly. And uh, one of the things that I learned is if, if, if uh, you've got an open mic and it's listening and it's listening to the, all the background and stuff, I learned about the, the background noise. I knew about that. And what I ended up doing is I do like, there was a time when I didn't know about noise removal at all. And that I had already learned a lot of stuff before starting this podcast, which is why I had, I had moderate confidence, even overcoming a lot of minions shortcomings of which there are plenty. And one of the things I had learned is you do a passive noise removal and that really helps with background junk and it helps with foreground junk that might interfere while a person is speaking, which, which, which is only a good thing. And if it's done gently and it doesn't damage a person's actual voice, which is actually possible. I also learned about how, about this, about noise spectrum and stuff like that and how to filter stuff out in different ways. And when I was looking at the waveform, even back then I was using audacity and I could see between a person speaking, you can see the little, you know, lines, the little lumps of blue by default in audacity where you can, you know, they're speaking. And in between, if you zoom in real close, if you kind of like, uh, if you not exactly amplify, but if you look closely enough or you change the settings so you can actually kind of boost things without actually changing the audio, you can just zoom in in a certain way. You, you can actually see the noise. And I would just be like highlighting and blanking, <laughs> highlighting and blanking between every single sentence. And I was actually fairly aggressive, even with some of this podcast's earlier audio, just to make it as good as I can. Because even going back after the fact and doing the audio engineering, I mean, can you really call it that if you're just like highlighting and blanking? I, technically, kind of. I know it's an insult to people that actually know what they're doing. Uh, I was manually doing it. And this is before I knew any better, which, which was just to automate that in certain ways. And I had to, I'm like... At some point, you have to realize that you're doing something by hand, and and it's got to be a problem that other people have faced. And, you know, like, sometimes other people make it seem really easy, and that's when real expertise comes to play. Um, and at some point, you have to know, you have to intuit that you're doing things the hard way for a lot of stuff. And this was the case for, for macros and what other people would call... Uh, chains. Ooh, I wonder if you can hear that motorcycle. Things that I can't solve. Problems that I can't solve with audio right now. At any rate, at any rate. Um, so yeah, I, I, I got to learn from the mistakes of previous shows and all this kind of stuff. And what I'm left with is some slightly more expert version of myself. The set of skills that I can't quite put my finger on that I might not even be able to teach, right? Which is part of the reason why I've been talking about a lot of my experiences and a lot of my learning as I'm going. And, and I know that that's not the conversationally interesting thing for a lot of people. And I, but the thing is, I'm going to, this opportunity will not last because I will have found a, a plateau of, limited expertise and I will be improving. There will not be the giant leaps and bounds from going from nothing to something. There, there are, there's a lot of stumbling around and doing things wrong. And, and there is a lot of improvement. And at some point you improve enough at any particular thing that you, you find your groove. And there's, there's not really much more to learn unless you're going to really actually become professional and unless 
you learn something astonishing and new or unless an expert pops by and goes, Hey, Hey, I mean, it sounds okay, but have you, have you tried this What about, or this? And you're like, and at some point when an expert comes to you and says that, and if it's somebody you can recognize as giving good advice, you would stop and you would kind of do things again and do things better. Those opportunities are pretty rare, but at some point, everything sounds pretty good to you and to your audience. And you'd kind of not have anywhere else to go. You'd kind of be done and you'd be focusing on a better return on investment for, for the comfort of you doing something or for some other aspect of it. So for us, it might be uh, improving the, if the audio engineering is good enough, then we would move on to doing like maybe better like video production is something that I want to get into as well. So there's, there's other stuff. And so the, the conundrum of having boring content because it's all full of administrivia, the, the administrivia kind of goes away because it's done. <laughs> it's, it's already done, been recorded in past shows. So it, it, so more content can go there. And uh, we're coming, we're coming into that point. There's going to be some interesting nuances in the future if I do actually get into the physical studio room uh, isolation stuff, which is just a challenge. Uh, but I don't know if I care right now. So we'll see. We'll see. Um, stuff to actually talk about. I do have a large list because we, we have been away for the last 18 days. And uh, that is actually too long. There's a problem with taking a vacation. So Let's say you're an office worker and you're a drone, right? And the in in Japan, there's a concept called a salary man, and this is this is kind of like wear your suit, go to work, work, work too late, get paid too little, uh, maybe stay in a coffin hotel, <laughs> and on the weekends. Isn't this the blue collar? Well, yeah, no, a blue collar worker. So a blue collar worker, at least for North America, I'm not sure if it's used in Europe, but the term collar is a reference to the shirt collar, the, sh the shirt color. And there's white and blue that are the primary ones. Maybe there's more. And blue collar workers are the people that would work with their hands. So they are, um, they would be considered people like in industry, like factory workers would be blue collar. They're the people that actually work hard, <laughs> like physical work. And white collar workers are uh, more social or technical. They're the ones in nice, comfortable, air-conditioned offices. And they both have their special hell for employment. But the, the type of work that I am talking about would be white collar. And... And that, uh, and that's what I have most experience with. And part of that is, and it's a real shame that our civilization, it ha has not enough, well, first off, not enough respect for blue collar working. And, and that's a, that's a problem. That's a civil, that's a civilizational problem. Like it is on a scale of, of a huge chunk of the population of humans not understanding another huge chunk of the population of humans. Because you have to think about the type of human. I don't mean type of choices that a person makes. This is a serious problem that humans have. It's, we have a hard time understanding that there are people that are not like us. And I mean that at a very deep level. I don't mean like oh, this person for some reason likes this other kind of ice cream. It's, it's, I know this guy that doesn't like chocolate. Like, how's that? How's that a thing? That's just weird. It's, it's, how is that a thing? I don't care. That's different. Different is, it's not like different is okay. Different is a reality, is a fact. And it, um, it is, it exists in a rift on many, many, in many circumstances, there's a, not a dichotomy because they're not opposites or anything like that. And it's not that there are only two, which, which is the other huge problem that humans aren't ready to understand. But 
for many endeavors, for many choices, for many opinions, there are what we would say two sides. So if there was a discussion between a bunch of people, a lot of things would would start organizing themselves into two camps, two factions, two positions, two, and it turns out that it's two kinds of human. And one of that, one of those uh, separations is blue collar, white collar. And the, the problem is most of the administration of the world is being incorrectly done by white collar people. The, I mean drone work. I don't mean uh, administration like in, uh, I'm not talking politics, partly because we don't do that, but because that's, that's not part of this particular bit of conversation. So white collar people think everybody's a white collar person and they don't, un, they think that blue collar work is just another kind of job that you would choose to take. But there's a, there's, it's like a set of personality traits that would lead a person to be either interested in or more comfortable if, if they actually had the opportunity to, to do blue collar work. So blue collar work would be like going outside doing landscaping or roofing or construction or factory or right. So a person going and working on an, on an oil rig or working on a boat or working like quote unquote real work, the stuff that makes your hands calloused, that's blue collar work. And white collar work is the stuff where it's your fingertips that are calloused because you're on a keyboard all day or you're doing paperwork or you're doing accounting or you're doing anything having to do with computers. Right. And, uh, the, most of the the loud visible stuff is from white collar workers who think that blue collar workers are just like them only instead of doing accounting they're doing construction right which is not the case and um why did i get down that road this is a a problem like i said this is a civilizational problem where the the I I know at least that side of stuff can't understand. So I know that white collar can't understand blue. I think the reverse isn't so true. I think that uh, that blue collar worker understands white collar workers. Anyway, one of the problems that we have in terms of that dichotomy, let's call it, is education. And f- first off, education has turned into daycare, has turned into raising children, which is which is the kind of evil that people can't recognize until humanity has been damaged. It's going to take us so many centuries to recover from the bad decisions of the last few. Um, and one of the problems is we're uh, making schooling choices skewed towards white collar work without actually recognizing that blue collar work is important to shrug. We don't know some, but it's an extremely significant proportion of humanity as humans, as people, as not people making choices for that work, but as human beings that are, let's call it more competent at a certain type of work. So a lot of education will just be like, well, you learn your math and learn your this and learn your that. And it's all stuff that's inside. It's all stuff that's that's mental. It's all stuff that's about learning. And whereas there's another entire field of let's, it's not raising a child, right? It's not, it's, but it's another field of education that has to do with, well, how do you do this? Which is a very different approach for what would become employment. And so a lot of there, so it's like, it's a difference between university and college which a lot of people think a college is just a, is like a university that didn't make it into a university. It's like a lesser version of things, but there is uh, like, there are technical colleges and things like this that, that deal with, well, how, how would you become professional at automobile repair? Right. Which, which is way more technical than people give credit for until their car, it breaks down. Um, well, going from high school into something that would lead to a career in that, and it's a career, uh, most people would go from 
all the way up to end of public school kind of thing to university. And they would like, they would become a wage slave for the kind of debt that gets accumulated so that they're paying rent to live because they they thought it was a requirement for them to go from end of public school into a private school into a university and the only choices they thought they had were white collar work and they got into debt and they thought that they needed to get that degree let's say hopefully right not everybody makes it and they thought they needed that to get the job that they wanted and they thought that the job would be able to pay for the degree, which isn't always true anymore, at least. And then at some point they would be free and clear and they would have all this free money. And then, but that, that's, that's an awful, <laughs> that is an abuse. That is an abuse of humans. And so, but there's another path that would go through that into blue collar work, let's call it. Right. That would, that would deal with the, uh, the other kind of, we don't, we don't know. We don't have the words for it. I could say the other kind of human, but I'm pretty sure that a lot of people won't because we don't have those conversations anymore. <laughs> and when those conversations have been had in the past, they've been had under really dark circumstances or the circumstances that have certainly not turned out very well. The idea of thinking of there being different kinds of humans ends up being, uh, ends up lead. <laughs> it ends up going pretty dark. It ends up being, uh, something like there being a tier of person that ought to be treated differently, which is, uh, which can, and, and again, it's the, it ends up being the othering. And the problem is that there are employment opportunities and there is a, there's a kind of happiness that can be found if you're making, if you're, if you're providing educational or employment opportunities, um, they can't all be like the one thing they have to be broad because there are going to be people that will find their love of their career or their, their general happiness doing things that aren't being taught anymore because we thought wrong. So in education, they say, you know, if the school has budget problems, they start cutting art, they start cutting music, they cut drama, they cut, and these things, and you look at them coldly and you go, well, those aren't important. Those will not get a job we need to focus on, on STEM. We need to focus on that science, technology, engineering, mathematics. And some people are trying to throw other junk in there. There is nothing else that belongs in, in those categories. The, there are multiple problems with this. First off, that stuff, that's, that's white collar. That is comfortable, safe. It is extremely intellectual. I mean, extremely. Um, and it absolutely does not suit everyone. It doesn't suit every student, which is different than, and it doesn't suit any, it doesn't suit every human because there, there are some people, do we need some other acronym? No. Music, drama, art, like poetry and English. And th these things matter in ways that we can't, we, humans haven't figured out yet. Uh, they're in the... <laughs> When civilization used to be more directly supported by slavery, right? Which is why we're not doing that right now. Um, when, so in ancient Greece and Rome, uh, when we think of the advancement of humanity, it was done on the backs of slavery. And that allowed a class of person who could pursue things that, that did not them. And those things did not generate income because the income was generated off the backs of, of other people. So we had, so that income was come for our philosophers came from people who were working for nothing to feed those people. Now we don't do that as such 
anymore yet. And so there we had this so-called comfortable educations, comfortable endeavors were possible back then. And when we look at education now, we don't, we don't, we can't act like that anymore. There's no mechanism for that. So to have somebody graduate with an arts degree shouldn't get them work because it, it's not useful for anything. And whenever that kind of job opportunity presents itself, it's in an environment where that, let's call it a business. So that business is flush with cash for some reason. It is highly successful. But as soon as that business struggles, HR should be fired because they're useless. That's a useless job that a uh, at a middle a middle manager should be able to handle all of that stuff. It should just be part of the well that and that's the thing. When you get big, you specialize off these little things and and, and HR becomes necessary for um, mediation and for doing hiring and firing. And uh and there are there are legal concerns that specialists should know about. But if it's a small business, you're not going to hire, you're not going to hire somebody like that because they can't make income. They can't optimize the business to make it lean and mean. And at no, no point does somebody in something, in, in something like HR, and I know I'm picking on that, um, there's no opportunity in something like HR for it to pay for itself. We can't think of it that way. And this is a, this is a, an incorrect view of things, really. And for education and for all this kind of stuff, there's the problem where we see a lot of, of things in terms of, well, will it be valued? Will it bring in revenue? And so teaching a young, we can't even say a young enough. So teaching an old child um, how to paint doesn't seem as relevant as teaching them physics. And that's technically wrong on all kinds of, for all kinds of reasons. First off, what you're going to do with physics, I mean, it is nice for you to, but honestly, it's a bunch of stories. Like you just, physics should be story time and it should be treat. It should be presented just like English. It, sh it couldn't be presented just like Shakespeare. It's, oh yeah, I remember hearing about the story of this person who climbed up the mast of the ship and dropped a, a sack and went, wait a second, the stack went, the sack went straight down. Why didn't it fall behind the ship to the back somewhere? What? And th that's a story in physics. W getting into the details of why that's a thing is also a story. It doesn't have to be treated like mathematics. There's an entire different kind of approach that can be done for physics. This is one of the arguments. It's done wrong. So people end up going, well, we need to change the way education is done because there aren't enough women that are interested. There aren't enough girls that got interested in the first place. Right? And that's if they're being polite about that quote unquote problem. So first off, it's not a problem. Second off, that way of thinking is is incorrect. It's not just unhelpful, it is technically incorrect. It's there. It isn't, <laughs> it isn't femininity that's, that's, that matters in this case. It's the blue collar, white collar thing is there is a way of presenting that topic that should have been done by people that aren't more white collar people. It shouldn't be, you shouldn't have mathematicians teaching physics always. You should have one perspective of physics that is from the white collar, from the mathematics perspective, and another kind that is from a blue collar from an artistic perspective, because there's a lot of really cool stories that can be learned. And as soon as a certain kind, again, oh, we don't know how to talk about this. There's another kind of human and it's not an interest thing. It's not them paying attention. It's not, it's, it's not, it's not, it's math. that's wrong. It, math is the problem. If there is a non-math way of explaining the exact same thing, of doing storytelling, 
the kind of student that would gravitate and be quote unquote excellent at drama at acting uh, at at understand like deeply understanding storytelling in Shakespeare, right? Which I I ha, it's it has value sort of somewhere, but it but it's not obvious. It's not white collar obvious. Um, approaching something like physics from a, a different perspective will will absolutely attract an entirely different kind, different class, a different color of of person. And this is, a, it, it is, it's, it's hard to say that it's, I want to say something like it's deeply upsetting, but it's kind of, if it's not your, ch- your children being educated wrong, it's, it's hard to talk like that. It's like, I, at some point, humans are going to have to figure this stuff out properly and understand that. It isn't about shaping all humans to become the same kinds of things. So you can fit them. So you can like put them all in the same grinder and then assign them jobs. It's, it's about uh, figuring out uh, how to present education in all the different kinds of ways, because there are different question mark. We might use fancy words like aptitudes, but again, we don't really have the language to talk about, to explain why persons A and B work differently, why they are testing differently. Because believe it or not, some people don't just don't test well because testing, the concept of testing isn't for them. It's not because they're not studying hard. It's not because they're not studying right. It's, be, it's a problem with the testing. And to, to, help, to help drive that problem home, um, when we... Okay, so IQ tests, intelligence quotient, is a, a notion. It's, it's still a fairly new notion. It is a scary, scary truth. And I'm, it's a... It's a because it's testable, it's provable, it's demonstrable, it's fact. But it's still wrong. <laughs> it's still wrong. And it's still wrong in a, in a deeply unsettling blue-collar, white-collar way. It's a bunch of high IQ people that made a test for high IQ. <laughs> like, there's something skewed there. There's something wrong there. Because there is more to like it's them thinking that everybody is like them so they built a test to find themselves without comprehending the idea that there is and again using a word like that other there are people that are not them that the aptitude is elsewhere (laughs) where testing is just not their thing so they're not going to quote unquote do well with testing of course not and uh, so people with a high IQ are people that are good at taking an IQ test. Okay. And, and it, there's some other, and it, it is an indica- it is an actual factual predictor for other things. It really is. But there's, there's more to life that isn't being attempted to be predicted for. Uh, there's a problem with that. I want to, before our break, I'm going to, going to briefly talk about the Dutch educational system, because this is something that helped me understand this perspective a little bit more. It, it helped me uh, feel a little bit of hope for humanity, because they actually have an educational track that separates, that provides two tracks of opportunity for kids to go to specialist schools. And there are multiple opportunities for them to to try these different avenues and to switch if they wanted to. So you can think of it like a degree. So you go from, uh, cause they're, it's public school all the way through for, for civilized countries. Um, so at, at, at X age, you like, you, we, we would say 18 years and one day for the hangover. So something like this, right? They, they get around to that age and then they have the choice. It's not final. And, and it is blue collar, white collar. They have technical schools and they have, right. So they've got head and hands and they, there are specialized schools for, cause you have to have specialized education 
for teaching a lot, a lot of things to actually make it a track that goes out from that to employment. So you have general school where it's just, it's shared. All of the students are all treated. It's the same meat grinder, but at some point it's separated into, into two troughs. <laughs> I, I really don't want to take that, that, um, that visual further than that. Um, but you know, it's true, right? And there are specialist schools for blue collar versus white collar for the technical stuff, for the, the actual physical engineering, like automobiles or like, I mean, if, if you wanted to get into something like, um, HVAC, so if you wanted to get into building air conditioning, or if you want to get into, um, uh, like electrical stuff or uh, working with plumbing or working with anything related to construction. And there are multiple specialties that are all actually separate, actually challenging. This isn't just some dude in overalls, um, uh, screwing up, um, drywall. Th this isn't painting. This is, there's a lot more that's there. So there's that side of things, that track, and there's another track that would be your STEM, right? All, and so we know sciences are ludicrously specialized into all kinds of branches. So, th and there's a lot of interest out there, but there needs to be, and it ends up being a dichotomy. There, there is this, this separation and, and they are, it's almost like there's a massive clustering of stuff that turned into this idea of STEM. And, but there is this other massive as massive, perhaps, um, clustering of these other, it, it's other education and it's other employment that's out there. And, uh, I feel it is a shame that, that this isn't more understood by, let's say, you know, countries that are moderately compatible in this case to the Netherlands. Um, and so we have the potential in other countries in Europe, Western Europe, if you want to be more specific, pick a country, right? We can say, well, they're moderate, they're different countries for a re for all kinds of reasons, but the educational system could have inspiration. And if I examined like Germany, for example, they have their own kind of university structure. But if I come to where we are in Canada, well we don't actually help our students find what school they'd be good for slash they would like how they would find love in life, um, love in their job. <laughs> That's not really a thing and forget about the United States. It's just, it's just not going to happen. They want to throw everybody into the same white collar universities and they're going to have half the students fail because they're not white collar as again, it's hard to say something like they're not white collar as humans, but they're, that's not where their love is. That's not where their interest is. Um, and that's not where they would succeed. And they just turn, they get this debt, like, congratulations, you're going to go be a plumber, but you have this arts degree as, as a debt. They should have discovered that well beforehand, before going to this terrible university. Anyhow, we're coming up on a break. We're going to be back in about 10 minutes. I'll see you back soon. Ah, oh, this is going to be fun watch. <laughs> I'm going to have fun listening to you complain about the editing, maybe. And we're back. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'll wait until the next episode to and have a segment ranting about all that stuff. I do have a whole lot to talk about. I'm glad I got derailed because it's always nice to have one consistent topic to, to go on, to go over. <laughs> so... And like I said, I, I think you really should, uh, we need reasons for you to talk because if we are talking, so I'm still looking at earlier episodes and the very early pre-show stuff is just us sitting around a table talking like more or less like we talk. Even then I was trying to rein it in because, because, you know, the, well, there's, there is, there are a few expressions like, uh, swearing like a sailor. And I, I don't do that. I'm not that kind of person, but you know, there's a kind of fast and loose experimentation with conversation that happens. And 
Uh, I don't have a lot of that because I tend to, th- I, I live in my head. I think a lot. And so I tend to think about topics before I even speak them. But speaking is different. And especially speaking with a person or explaining with a person uh, is very different. So our early pre-show stuff, uh, it has some great stuff in it, even though it's kind of inarticulate. And, oh, man, the quality sucks. But I will say this again. Minion, you talked way more. And it's really high-quality stuff. I mean, it's still you, but it's it's still high-quality stuff compared to now, certainly, when when it was just like that back then, uh, which, which is why I still think we need to have the live experience. Um, well, it's just basically due to interest. Maybe, yeah. Maybe, yeah. And uh, so we were talking just during the break that you were pointing out a bottle of soap, and you were ranting. <laughs> Do you want to rant again? No, it turns out that the other guy who poured them, he poured what was left into the bottle. Oh. And then switched the lids. Okay. I mean, the problem when there are other people around you and they try to be smart, <laughs> they're like, oh, this thing should do this, should go here. You're like, no, dude, you're touching something that isn't yours, doing something unexpected. <laughs> um,. Yeah, this is why uh, I've, I've lived with and around a whole lot of people in my life. And after, I mean, after a few centuries, you kind of get used to how dumb humans are. There's kind of, the consistency you get is kind of, is kind of that, it, it's strange. It's Humans are dumb in each their own unique way. So what is consistent is that humans are dumb. And it's just like, well, you have to figure out what, oh, it's a new person. I, I wonder, I wonder what that quirk is. And it's, and then you have to just learn to work with that quirk. And sometimes you can, and maybe it's, you know, whenever you're around somebody new and you discover that, that their thing, <laughs> if you discover their thing, it might actually be that you discover that, um, it's, it's actually you. It's, it's actually you that's being picky or that's not being articulate about what your problem is or why. Um, and you just need to let it go. And, uh, sometimes you're right and they're wrong. And so there's no, there's something called the fallacy of the middle ground, which is like, maybe you're a little wrong. They're a little wrong. You need to negotiate. No, sometimes the other person can just be wrong. And, uh, there's the other fallacy, of course, which is, you know, maybe you do that and you think they're wrong, but it's, it's 100% you and you're, you're just doing whatever the heck. And I have found living with and around all kinds of people that, uh, I have, I have learned to specifically, let's say, discover those things. Be like, oh, this is this person's quirk. Like Minion you shed, for example. You went away for a little while, you were you were locked away. It's my long hair. Yeah, well If it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be shedding okay. technically. Well the the thing about even if hair is down middle of your neck. Even if it's like short. Yeah, then it'll do that. Because I've I've noticed that from other people. It is it is nasty. I don't know. I think what's happening is as soon as hair gets to a certain length, when being like standing in front of you, standing over your bathroom sink, looking at the mirror, combing hair, brushing hair, whatever, that as soon as hair gets to a certain length, that additional uh, consistency of pull will pull more hair out. Or there's more opportunity for it to, to sprinkle off the off your back onto the floor. Something like that has happened. And maybe if it's short, it all falls out of the shower. Like maybe it's like the belly button lint problem. Like we can make a bunch of guesses, but half of it is kind of like it's mysterious. <laughs> it seems Jeez. really to everyday people. There, I'm sure there's like a, a belly button society, lint society, or something stupid, but. Um, cause that's just the, the, the lint off of the inside of your shirt, which is usually cotton for people, right? So it'll, and it's, it's a body hair thing and it's a physics, right? <laughs> Whatever. Um, 
but uh, that's, I mean, that's your quirk and staying up playing video games is another one. And I haven't stayed up playing video games since the raid. <laughs> it took you days to recover from that, man. And we never even talked about that. Actually, it's like two or three days. <sighs> yeah, that's, it's kind of like the jet lag problem, right? You push. I technically don't suffer through that. <laughs> Well, you've got the night owl problem, which is... I've got the stay up, but now my body is actually getting tired. And, or It has always been tired, and I could, for a while... Up until now, I was able to somewhat ig mostly ignore it, but now I can't. You're getting old. <laughs> it's either that, or I'm forced, or if I'm realizing... Or I just don't find what I want to do more appealing at this point. Well, um, the two games that I played, Destiny, I'm pretty much caught up. I've done most of the, pretty much all available content it has to offer other than chasing numbers that just go up and they're somewhat of a chore and they're done a long, over time. I can just fast track and work on that, but that just turns out to be a small grind, which I don't want to attempt. And through League of Legends, a game that's been out for almost 10 years now, every year around this time, they spice it up by making changes or improvements, or they would call it improvements, but it's when you, they're adding restrictions now to things, and it just I don't want to play it as much as I wanted to, as I wanted before then. This would probably, unless they reverted, this is probably I'll probably look to do other things other than League of Legends of Destiny, which is not in my priorities at this moment. Yeah, it ends up being change ends up being an opportunity for you to just walk away, and and, and that's it's the World of Warcraft problem, uh, which is. Uh, that is one of the finer examples in terms of, of longevity of entertainment, which is... Hello, post-production Sai here. I removed a clip that's going to be uploaded separately regarding audio issues we had with Twitch. So you were talking about League of Legends, and it's not exactly like the Path of Exile style seasons, but it is a yearly change to quote-unquote refresh the game. And they basically damage it every time they do that because they're going to make changes that you, that are acceptable and they're going to make changes that are disagreeable to different. Some restrictions are nice, but the current, but what they've done now, they've, so they've introduced their item classes. No, there was before, uh, before till now, there was three item classes. You had your basic your higher and then your final item or final item component. So it takes like it takes it takes components from basic and does up a tier and then your final tier. Okay, like dependencies, yeah. Which was fine. I get it. Now they have a one called mythic, and you're only allowed one. Oh. But once you have that one, it boosts. So there's like four tiers now. The four tier four is mythic, and then. Any tier threes you have, they give a small bonus depending on what the mythic states. Oh, so just additional complexity. And they took a few items away due to, I guess, people not using them or it's not as popular. So it's more of a niche item, hmm. sort of, for certain characters. Oh, and, and the items apply broadly and are available to all characters? Yeah. Okay. But now Mythic is just locked to, or it's not, my gripe now is that you have Mythic items and I tend to build like some items together on certain, like on certain characters and that's completely removed. Oh, so basically your favorite, the your comfort has been removed. Yeah. Um, I was talking about there's some it's not exactly the equivalent i always bring up world of warcraft because that's my pastime of preference and it's it makes changes every expansion it tries to justify the more than triple a cost for the for the game plus it's got an ongoing subscription fee 
which is all manner of unfair. It, it is an, it's abusive. And I went and I did the math, and it's something like four hundred fifty dollars for the game, which which is not. And this is Canadian dollars, and th this is a lot, a lot of money. And they're not making the game better; they're just making the game different. And I have talked about this. I've talked about this repeatedly, not on this podcast, but to guildies and friends. And uh, I've talked about the problem where. They, every single expansion, they have the garbage thing that they add in. And it's always terrible. Every single time they add this new thing, this new mechanic that's in there, this new endeavor, this, it's the flavor for that particular expansion. And it is bad every single time. And it is removed from the game every single time. There might be a very slight variation that gets put in somewhere somehow, but it's garbage. And it remains sort of niche, sort of out of the way, sort of optional. And so the, the it's it's on life support. And the problem with the game is it is only any good slash any played at all because it's old. Because there are people that are familiar and that we play together and we have fun together. That that's it. And there are becoming more and more cases where somebody will just like look at it and go return on investment, not fun, not fun enough, not good enough. People aren't important enough. Uh, they'll, it will be there. It will become their minor game or they'll do what I did. I just took a break. I mean, I came back in and there are new people there that don't understand <laughs> me who don't, who, who not only are not familiar with people like me, if there are people like me, they're not familiar with me. So I had developed this, the, the comfort with the existing people. Cause I, I came in and I'm, and, and I, cause I would talk a lot and I would, I would be, I'm not really a social, I'm not an organized kind of person, anything like that, but I'm, I will talk about how I'm breaking the game in various ways. And it's that that is one of the ways I have fun. I find my fun with the game by discovering all the dumb nuances, all the things that are broken, all the things that are unfinished, all the I I will discover every bug, and um, and I and I'll talk about it in, in guild chat, and I <laughs> had one person be like, "I'm just gonna ignore you." <laughs> Like, oh, well, that's an example of somebody who doesn't know who I am. <laughs> it's like, well, I'm not really the new person coming coming in. I'm the old, I'm, well, okay, not, I'm old. I'm fairly senior at this point. I'm coming back. And I'm not, I'm not just coming back. I'm coming back with all of everything that I had been, that, that it's, it's not necessarily all been pent up, but there's new content out. So I came in. And I'm like, well, I broke it already. I did this and this and this, and I need to, I couldn't even play my regular character because I broke the game so hard. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm fairly sure I'm the only player that's ever broken it in the way that I did. And, and so I would talk about this stuff and, uh, and I was talking about, it, I'm like, well, I, and I, I'm starting to play the, the game and I'm like, wow, this is this is really different from the beta because I got a, a very late invite into the, the, I don't know. It, I call it a closed beta because it's an invite only beta thing before the game releases to kind of um, iron out all of, all of it. And uh, it was, it was awful. It was God awful because I would go through and I found a couple typos, which is inexcusable in my mind. I found just really confusing things that were added in quests that were it it was just it felt off everything felt off and I, and some of it was just philosophically wrong and um and so and so i i mean i wanted to help but at some point i just got burned out from the beta went well like i i don't know what that and i left and blizzard went okay we're not releasing this this steaming pile and and because i had talked about this before with and they just ended it. They they just went, okay, well, I know we made a promise. Uh, we're not releasing this. <laughs> we're going to wait. 
We're going to wait until for as long as it takes, we're going to fix this. And then they gave another release date at a different point. And, uh, I, there must've been a, enough of people like me that just looked at the beta and went, I don't understand what's going on. I don't know what to do. I don't. Right. And when I, when I, when I started coming in, I, I appeared like a new player, a new person in the guild. Part of it is because I had a slightly different, I have a, I always have variations on the exact same name because I never want to confuse people as to who I am. So I come back and, and I'm talking, I'm like, wow, this is like, a, I'm, I'm really glad they took the extra time. Like this is a, a night and day difference. This is, I don't recognize any of this from the beta. And I had somebody saying, oh no, no, this is, I am absolutely certain this is 100% like the beta. And I'm like, no, I don't. I don't have a memory, but none of this is, is like it was. And, uh, that it was, it didn't become an argument It's become this one side. Oh, I'm not listening to you. I'm like, okay, new guy. <laughs> um, it, and it remains to be seen. Oh, so, um, our, we're a very casual, well, very, we're a serious casual rating guild and rating is the point. And we do, we have other activities and stuff like that, but the, the goal, the point of our assembling together ends up becoming the rating. And we're, we're a late night, long rating guild. And so it's four hours of straight of rating. Well, not straight because we, we have a break structure and all this kind of stuff. And that break structure is what inspired this podcast's structure. And the the thing is, and we get a lot of people because we're highly successful, like mysteriously successful. And that's because like, if you want to be good at life in basically anything, at some point you have to find the groove and have to chill out. <laughs> you have to get good enough and then take your return on investment and direct it towards the things that will give you more. You can't just keep focusing. You can't keep sharpening that one single blade. You have to go to something else and get as much as you can out of something else and then something else and then something else. You can't become expert at one single aspect of something that you're working on. You have to go and find all the peripheral things. At some point you have to round yourself out in some sense. And so we're, we're pretty casual and we, we chill out and we all try our best as individuals, but everybody's got a job or a family or all right. It, and, but we try to pull our own weight. Don't compare. We don't on the, all this other stuff. And it's like a lot of things like guild repairs and potions and flasks and food are just provided by the guild. And we all pitch in to help, but there's no responsibility for that. It's just like th there are little rewards that are given out and it's just, it's social. It, and there's a lot of the, the, elitism, let's say the, you know, if you want to come raid with us, you have to do this for yourself. You have to go and it's, we don't have that. Um, and, and so it's mysterious for a lot of people kind of coming in and a lot of people who are from that environment that, you know, go get them kind of trying hard environment. They'll, they'll come to this guild cause they see the numbers. They'll see the successes. They're like, I want to win too. And they'll come here and they'll be like, why is everybody all unprofessional, so to speak? And then they'll come into our rating and they and they realize that they can't stay up that late at the start, which is hilarious. And, and the, and it's, it's just fast and loose and it's, and we have all of these new people, like the one that I was just talking about, and they don't last, they last one week of rating and then they're gone. So they'll be around for the guild, they'll level, they'll be social, they'll come in our groups, they'll, they'll get, they'll get gear with us and then they'll just be gone in a week, two, maybe three. And it happens every expansion. And it's very strange that, that for me to come back and for me to have all of this kind of person, I'm like, I wonder if these people are, are going to be around, <laughs> around at all. Um, so it, Hopefully they'll get, they'll get used to me. I'm not sure why I went off on that rant. <laughs> um, the, I will continue to, to talk about that video game briefly. Do you, do you want to take a, a break? I think we probably should. And 
and just keep our schedule, make the timer correct. Yeah, we've got 10 minutes until the next break, though. Mm -hmm. No problem. So, um, the new expansion came out, and um, the I have talked about video games casting as broad a net to capture as many different kinds of players as possible. I've talked about that before. That ends up making every single game that does that becomes more vulnerable because now they will have captured a variety of people, a variety of wallets, and now they're responsible for the upkeep of all of those different uh, different perspectives, those different players. Now they have to appease a larger and larger audience, and they're competing against every other game that has done that because your game that has this Farmville nonsense is now competing against that game that has that Farmville nonsense. It's, or it's competing against Farmville. <laughs> like it's competing against games that are specialist for that particular thing. And so now a game is now vulnerable for every single little target sub audience that they, they have. Their core group is kind of there. And now that all of their development efforts get diffused over this over so the, it used to be distilled into this one core group, and that's what makes the game popular in the first place. And now it gets diffused across all these different target audiences. So the game becomes worse. It becomes more casual or it becomes whatever. And World of Warcraft has done this repeatedly. They have, this is a fundamental business problem. They, they have decided that if they captured a larger market, they would get more money. And it worked. And now it's going to kill them because they need to keep doing that. They need to keep that up. That, that upkeep is going to be very expensive. So it's not going to pay for itself. They had the money. They kind of got the money up front. Now everybody in the market's doing that kind of thing. And they're competing with everybody else that's doing that. Every other specialist game, every other indie game there. It's terrible. And entering into this new expansion, that has become very obvious. And I'm, I entered into this game and I'm playing it and I have observed that I, I have the phrase playable cutscene. And it's the, uh, oh, I can't remember what the term is. It's the God of War cutscene where you press X at the right time. And then the action occurs. It's not even a choose your own adventure or anything like that, but it's, ba it's bad. Uh, Okami, the other video game that I like, does that as well. And it is terrible. It is absolutely terrible. Just show me a movie of me winning. I don't want to press these buttons. It's just dumb. It's not the game that I, that I purchased. I paid money. And for World of Warcraft, there may as well be the equivalent because you go, you're told to go and do this thing. Go over here and fight these guys. I'm like, okay, awesome. Cause the game is about war. <laughs> so, so you go in your character and I'm going to go beat up stuff. Fine. And the game's like, oh, here, have this other character that comes along with you that's all badass and will go and beat stuff up with you. Like, what? Great. So am I playing the game or am I just watching this other character do stuff? And I happen to be selecting what things it kills because I'm not playing the game anymore. It's I'm observing. It's just it's a cutscene that I get to kind of interact with. And that happened again and again and again so many times that it made the entire experience of playing the game weak. It made me not feel like, like I'm the, well, like I'm the protagonist really. So that's uh, that's extremely disappointing. Now I'm an end game player. So technically speaking, I shouldn't care technically speaking. Um, but it, it is an observation that I have, that they have done this. They've made a lot of stuff very Care Bear, very friendly, very safe. And uh, so I'm just going to slog through that garbage and get to the end game. And, and that's, that's the game that I will play. And that's the, the, that's the core. That's become the core of the game. It used to be the leveling was the core of the game. And now it no longer is because they want to, they want to capture an audience that will have fun at that level of stuff. Um, so I kind of got pu pushed out, so to speak, as the game changed, I, I migrated into other stuff and that kind of works for me because, uh, I ended up because I had a problem with my character 
a rather significant problem. Um, I didn't need help with it, but I needed a confirmation that my brokenness could not be solved by them. And they, they chose to not solve it. And, uh, so I, I made one, I had a one other character that I played through all the way up to the maximum level. And I was doing all this stuff, uh, but the way they made this expansion slash the way they reworked the game more or less has made it more friendly for you to make a, an additional character and go through and get it power leveled up, slog through all that garbage questing to get yourself to maximum level to get into the end game stuff. So it actually made it the fact that I did the work for the one character means I can, I'm now halfway more than halfway with my other characters, bring it all the way up. And, uh, that's, that's, um, that philosophy, that is a good philosophy, uh, lowercase g good. So it's, it's, but it, it, I don't know. I really like, I want games to be hard. I want them to be hard, but not in a, a tooth grinding sense. I don't want them to be hard because they're they're time gated or because they're uh they're how would I explain it? You know, there are certain games where if you just if you know life them, so you, you don't sleep and you play every single day, you know, uh that you get better. You are better, you get a better character. There are games that are like that. Or there are parts of games that are like that. And what I want is a game that where uh, skill where skill brings is the success and um there couldn't is you no know life the same skill or couldn't you no know life a skill pattern until it gets decent well yeah i mean as a human being you can just keep practicing until you're really good at it and i'm okay with that i'm okay with that i'm also i also you know despairingly accept that there are going to be some humans that are just better than me at performing certain actions. I'm like, okay, well, like speedrunners on your favorite video game. Well, I mean, there are some people that are really amazing number crunchers and will be like, well, if I do this rotation of stuff, these patterns are more successful in these certain circumstances. And they just have a brain that can store all these different patterns and they'll, they'll, they will be running through scenarios and we'll be pulling one pattern out for this kind of thing and one pattern out and other people will just be like, well, this is, this is a tough guy. So I'm acting like this, or this is a group of guys. So I'm acting like this. And one of them will be more successful than the other at killing faster or getting bigger numbers. Right. This is why I like the guild that I found or that I was recommended to, which is, uh, you know, dude, just chill out, come participate. Don't be a jerk. You know, try to pull your own weight. Don't complain about other people. Don't compare. Like, don't don't post your numbers. And, um, you know, just come out and be be friends. Like, be cool. And if if you have a bad day, you have a bad day. If if but if you are bringing everybody else down, the you will get private comments from the guildmaster. You you won't get complaints from nobody else should be privately tattling on you or should be any of this stuff. There's no drama, but if you're bringing everybody else down and you're not bringing, if you have consistently not, not brought reasonable, there's some people that are, that are, that are obviously when you have any group of people, they're going to be people that are average. They're going to be people that are above average. They're going to be people that are below average. And if you come to, if our group, for example, and you're below average, that's okay. Like that, that's a thing. <laughs> that's a thing. It comes around, right? <laughs> you might have a great day. You might have a bad day. Some people are just consistently below average. It's like, okay, well, are you fun? <laughs> are you cool? Good. Well, you're bringing that, that, that is not measurable in the table of numbers when people are comparing themselves to one another. Like success in a group isn't necessarily what you can, can have measured in that place over there. It is often, um, spread out over unmeasurable or innumerable things. 
or it could just be the fact that you know you're you're just you're just that quiet guy who doesn't get in the way um you're that helpful person you're that social person you know you're nice or you you're complimentary or you're whatever we've had people that come into our environment and they'll beat themselves up because they start comparing themselves and nobody else is doing it they do it to themselves and i had one guy i liked him he was he was great um and he he kicked himself out of the guild because he he was not meeting his own expectations and it's and that's a real shame because i like the guy um after he left uh, there was kind of this open permission to make fun of him which i did not i don't appreciate that but but it started happening thankfully that's done <laughs> But he was kind of up the open permission to make fun of people or that it just settled down. Like, no, no. I mean, the officers were started basically bullying on his name after he left the guild, uh, which I, I do not like to see. Um, but that that did end. I might have actually complained and been one of the reasons why it ended. But but things to feel proud about. That is a rare case. Yeah, that's that's the kind of thing that may, would make me really uncomfortable. To know that you never want to talk behind somebody's somebody else's back. Um, at any rate, okay. So this is going to be another break, and we're going to come back for a final segment in about ten minutes. I'll see you guys soon. We're back. Well, hi everyone, and we didn't have break music, did we? We. Oh, for love of God! <laughs> <sighs> Captain Reliable. We no, we do have break music. But with the audio issues that I'm going to fix for next time and make sure that it shouldn't happen. <laughs> yeah, just go talk to Ninstrivia while I go finish up my noodles. Okay. <laughs> Minion has the munchies. So, um, man, what can I talk about? I do have a whole lot of Administrivia to talk about. Uh, I actually did. Because I got into a bit of a rant, and we had a uh, you know, second segment, had some technical issues. We're still going to end at our usual time. <laughs> this minion typing live. Um, so we... Yeah, so there was an earlier issue that we had in a previous podcast. We thought it was our issue. We, we thought it was an internet connection issue where... What we normally do for break music is uh, what Minion had been doing, which I kind of warned him against, maybe it wasn't firm enough, is if we're getting... So copyright for music is an issue if you're doing streaming. Now, there are nuances of it, which are... are they're weird. So there are... We, so we, do, we have a live show that is recorded that gets sent out to twitch and twitch has its own way of handling copyright issues and copyright issues is is not specific to music but they are the most highly interested in this so there's a lot of automation that catches this stuff it might catch things live uh, but that's not usually a concern normally it will catch stuff when it's done when the stream is done and it's it's set aside on twitch to be viewed it used to be, there used to not be an expiry. Now it, it expires after a certain amount of time. It'll get deleted by Twitch. And during, and in that video on demand, what uh, Twitch slash its robots slash the RIAA or whatever elements um, help them, they'll actually mute segments. And so we've, we've had to pay attention to how music is done. Is this and, a music copy? Or sorry, I was answering a phone. Did you, you talk about music copyright? That's part of it, yeah. So we, we've had some concerns. And what you were doing is you were streaming live from YouTube via no copyright sounds. This is a company organization, I don't know, which provides tracks with no copyright. And it's useful for streamers, for example. They are... They are major, so it's it's you're not going to have as many, you know, oops, I thought this was copyrighted, and, and you don't have to deal with the technical and legal side of stuff, uh, which can be a big deal. And it won't mute parts of our stream, and it won't 
interfere with our uploading stuff after the fact and all whatever other nonsense might happen. And so what we had happening in a previous show is it was being streamed from them via their playlists, pulled down our net connection, mixed into our audio and streamed back up into our Twitch stream, which is a, a, which is an inefficient thing to do because it's one extra channel to download it in the first place. And we thought we had issues with our net connection or something like that because the audio was just kind of weird. It was wonky and laggy and there were, there were silent periods. And it turns out there were problems at YouTube's end, which is a, which is weird because I never would have thought it because they're a totally professional, <laughs> um, I don't know, endeavor. But yeah, apparently, I mean, it's weird, but it happened. Hey, what you going to do? Um, so, I mean, we do have some other stuff that we wanted to talk about, but Minion, you were going to talk more about Destiny 2. Keep going, my noodles are almost done. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and when the noodles are done, he's going to be eating them, so he's not going to be able to talk. So, yeah, it's okay, I'll just take over. <laughs> like, what has changed? Really nothing. Um, I, I had talked about this before, um, with the new... It's, it's new hardware, new positioning, new all this kind of stuff is the microphone that I have, which is the Rode NT1, does not generate any internal noise. And the way it's been set up is if I leave the microphone open and I, I am not talking, it literally picks up nothing. Uh, there is nothing. There's not even the smallest little blip in when I'm doing recording, when I'm looking at it. The light does not light up on it. It receives nothing. Uh, so I actually don't need to do any uh, noise removal process on this. And I'm not, that's, I don't know if I should remove that from my, my macro, from my, my processing chain. Uh, it's going to have to exist for, for a minion because he does have noise and that means that I would need to create a, a processing macro separate from between me and Minion. I knew this was going to come sooner or later because part of the audio processing is and everybody's got a different voice. It isn't just that there are, uh, there's different equipment, but there are different circumstances for audio as well. So for example, if you're recording in two different rooms, depending on your microphone and how things work, you will get different room acoustics. Okay. Now there's all that kind of stuff. That seems pretty obvious, but it, there is a part of the post-production where what matters is, uh, also includes the person's voice and every voice is different. So the obvious one, the obvious line we can draw, which is wrong, but the obvious line we can draw is male, female. And we can say that there are, there's a range and there's a range in one direction and the other. We can talk about this stuff, but that's not, that, that's not true. I mean, that's not technically true. So there are other nuances like sibilance. So this is people who talk with their S's like this, and it, it can be a lisp, right? And so for me, I've got a larger tongue and it doesn't work right. So I've got a certain way of speaking. Okay. That's one thing. There's other people that plosive a lot. So this is the Peter Piper picked a pack of pickled peppers. Now that can be an equipment issue. That can be a technique issue. So for example, the microphone and the distance from a person, the mannerisms of a person when they speak, some people just do that more. Sometimes it's just practice. It's, yeah, it could be the, the human being is structured in a certain way that they are more vulnerable to. And it just happens to be a problem in audio due to the nature of the physics of how the audio was recorded, recorded in conversation with a person like that, that they record like that in conversation, you may not notice it and it wouldn't be a bother at all. It's just, it's a human speaking. It doesn't actually matter to us, but things are wacky as soon as you throw it through the, the equipment. Right. Things get picked up wrong and they damage the quality of the audio and, uh, the audio equipment itself might, might really matter. For example, I have talked about, 
I've got a pop filter, so it, it, it protects the microphone from those puffs of air that happen. And, and uh, the pop filter I have, I can't plosive through it. I can't. So I'm not going to do it, but if I, if I lean up real close and I, and I try my P's really hard, the microphone will not pick up those gigantic spikes. So there's stuff like that. But, but, there is a tonal quality in voices. And there is a concept of, uh, like, it's a target, it's an appropriate, it's a, it's a, what sounds nice. And it isn't like, you know, there, there's the voice for radio kind of thing that's happening. And that's a bit of technique. That's a bit of the person. That's a bit of all kinds of stuff. Um, and there's the notion that you can take a voice and you can massage it in certain engineering ways to make it sound more like that, whatever that means. But that, quote unquote, that might mean something if your audience is, uh, is listening to an audiobook, or if they're listening to a podcast, or if they're listening to certain kinds of commentary massaging a voice isn't a universal concept there there's not i can't take your voice and make sure that it is uh, as listenable whatever that means in an audiobook context i can't take every person's voice and do that some persons some voices are just really good at one thing and not as good or maybe even bad at something else right it some and it's sometimes it's not technique now I want a link between audio engineering. So this is the post process processing stuff and voices. Now, again, not equipment, not mannerisms, not technique, but voices. And the voice is something that is only, there is a relaxedness that can happen to a person's voice that does change some stuff but there are fundamental structures in the human being that give them their own fingerprint in audio. And the audio engineering uh, is, has this fight between what your voice is like and what the flavor of microphone is. Because microphones um, have a kind of like an exactness that varies across the spectrum. So the, the deep, the bass, and the high, the treble. Uh, some microphones are more sensitive to certain parts of the range, and certain voices are melodic across that range and in different ways. And so a microphone will damage the voice in its own unique way. And audio processing can massage a voice in across that spectrum, all the way across in every single nuance. And it's, it's phenomenal what's possible. The, the technology is, is incredible. And in post-production, there is, there is this massaging, this fighting, this, the plasticity of the voice, uh, can, can be, can be sculpted in all kinds of ways. And the thing is, if you create a template, you can push a voice through that template, through that engineering, and get your quote unquote best audiobook voice. That person's best audiobook voice. That person's, you know, that person's best podcast voice. That person's best this voice for that, for that listener, for that particular market. And it would have to be a different template for each person for each human not just for the recording room or for the microphone or for the technique but for the individual humans and so i knew sooner or later i would have to well enough understand voices and listenability to make something that is different between myself and anybody else and somebody else it would have to be unique to that person and I also suspected that I would have to have different elements in that editing chain uh, that were unique to different people's setups. So, for example, 
noise removal. Now it turns out noise removal doesn't, it, it isn't applicable in the same way for my microphone setup as it is for somebody else's setup. So my processing chain, maybe I shouldn't have any noise removal. I need to learn about what noise removal really does. Cause I thought of it as being, you, you take a sample of open microphone and it listens to the equipment and it listens to the room. And then you take that and you, you go, ah, I don't like that. And you mute it a little bit. And that muting also happens all the way through every sentence to, to clean it up, to clarify, to remove the equipment noise and stuff. And uh, that's how I understand it. Maybe there's something else happening and maybe I need to do noise removal. And uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, Cause I have, and I have lots of other nuances that may not apply to the next microphone over or whatever. Now, Minion, I don't know if you're still eating noodles, probably. Um, mm, that's too hot. I can chat for a bit. Why? <laughs> um, we, we had been talking about having you sort of inherit my earlier microphone. Um, I, you don't talk enough and you have to, you have to remember this is, this is my backup. I had talked about the necessity of not upgrading too far away. So this is my backup. And so I'm still hesitant at even loaning it. Um, but are you still interested in, in using it, in improving your audio? Well, new raid came out for recording probably, but as a everyday thing, maybe even I feel hesitant on using it or asking to use it for every day. Well, I mean, maybe it's not appropriate for video games, right? Because, I mean, you've got distance issues with a microphone like that. Yeah. And if you're in a, if you're in a swivel chair and you've got a controller in your hand and you're moving around, then having a microphone in a fixed place in space is having to like lean up a certain way to make sure your audio is good. Yeah, that kind of sucks. Uh, that microphone, I was able to position it uh, like up and away at an angle and quite far. And I was heard very well and I would just use push to talk, but it does not work as a, an open mic because it is too, it is unforgiving. It listens too hard to a larger area. And if you try to tune that, then it's requirement for distance becomes much greater. So, and there's no way you can have a thing close to your mouth. Like you, know, you, you, it's half a foot. Right. So if you take your pinky and thumb and stretch them out, so you make a fist, but with your pinky and thumb out, um, I can't remember what I can, there's a sports team. I don't know if it's basketball that uses, that uses that as a, that as their fan sign kind of thing. Um, but if you, what? if you stretch out your pinky and thumb, it, it's, it's like if you basketball or whatever the heck it is, where they, they do this thing as they're cheering. I can't remember. Um, there's a few different versions of, of doing the horns or doing the whatever that that's different in different cultures. Oh, uh, Chicago Bulls. Yeah. I'd imagine it's, but I, I think they do the, it's, it's, a uh, in, in American sign language, it's, it's, I love you is the sign, but they position it differently to represent the horns of the bull. And it's different in different cultures too. So it's a rather awkward it's awkward. You position your fingers in different ways and it means something for some <laughs> humans are weird. Oh, like the, um, like a t the best example is when Itali Italians are hand gesture, hand gesture people. If you manage to get, if one manages to get angry, the, uh, international, I forgot, like eating your, no, the FU symbol, when the FU for Italians is a lot different from other cultures. Well, just like the thumbs up for Australians is, is different than what it means here. And, uh, this world is great and I hate it at the same time. An American president as he was leaving on a visit to Australia, um, I think it was, uh, Bush Jr. George Bush Jr. Um, actually gave, I think it was a double thumbs up as he was boarding his plane. <laughs> like, ooh, yeah, that's, a. Uh, I mean, they're cool. <laughs> Australians are surprisingly cool for how hot a country is and how dangerous it is. But, um, that, uh, you do not, 
you, if, for example, if, if, uh, if he was leaving Canada and he did the double middle fingers up, <laughs> that would be inappropriate. I think that probably the, cause, uh, in, I don't, I don't know why it is even, uh, so in aspects, I think it's aspects of Christianity, the bull's horns. So from that sports team, if you position your hand differently, like you point the fingers up or something like this, this is the horns of the devil, which is, I don't even know where that came from. Cause like Christianity is really weird. And if you were to take that and rotate it a different way and put it behind your back, it means something even, it means it's a ward against bad luck slash evil in, I can't, I think it's throughout South America. I don't know if it's specific to a, uh, a country because I think it's just a Latin American thing in general. Oh, they kind of did this in Rick and Morty. Did they? <laughs> With the hand gestures, how, um, so Rick made a he called it a microverse battery or it's a tiny universe in a battery that's powering his uh ship okay and when he went down to that planet he flipped people our our american gesture of flipping our north american gesture of flipping people off the finger whenever he goes down there he he does that to the people going hey welcome and it's the, that just that version's uh, gesture of saying hello. Oh, wow. It's like waving, right? And then he completely forgot about it. Then on the next visit over, it's like, he grabbed the person, what did you just say to me? Threatening the person. <laughs> and then the person's like, this is the gesture that you taught us. What are you talking about, Rick? Oh, wow. I was like, oh, yeah, right. Oh, yeah, I, forget. I completely forgot. <laughs> How things backfire on you. Like some weird version of the cargo cult. I don't know if you know what that is. Nope. So the, um, this is a real story. I can't get the details right. So I'm going to gonna kind of tell you a tale. So I want you to imagine an island that, it, that has never been visited by oh. civilized people, right? And it gets visited by a plane, right? And all the na so the natives are like early technology humans. They're humans, right? But they haven't discovered iron working because they're on an island. So they don't. Ha they not only don't have these things, they don't have use for these things. So they're they're not like developing weapons of war or anything like that because there's just not a lot of humans. It's just. They're all chill people. They all get along. They have stuff for, they have tools, but it's, it's wood and stone and a plane shows up. Now, the concept of humans flying <laughs> is, at, is unthinkably outside of the scope of how they view the world. So a bunch of dudes show up on a plane and they come by and they're like, wow, this is a uh, high because, <laughs> you know, natives have been traditionally really dangerous because they, they live in extreme. It's not us. Get rid of it. Well, no, no, it's not, not necessarily like that. But so for example, for first nations, in North America, um, it's a massive amount of space and humans have been here for a long time. Um, and so they, they've, They've bred and they have separated into distinct cultures and there have been clashes of civilization. So Warcraft has been around for a very long time. So some other person that happens to show up on a boat is, is, is still is out, is outside. And there has been enough antagonism, quote unquote, internally. I mean, a continent is bloody huge, right? Uh, that, that war with that new faction is just as likely as any other conflict. But if it's a tiny little island and there's only like the one tribe, then th there's no concept of conflict other than the kind of infighting that extended families have, right? Which is probably plenty, but so it's not like the bows and arrows trying to shoot down this um, plane, which there's actually another... I do not know where specifically South, South America, I'm pretty sure it's South America where you can get this picture of a plane that was like flying by to check the place out. 
And, but there's no landing strip or anything. It's just deep, deep jungle. But it's flying over to see if there's any clearings, if there's any civilization to, to map things out. Because there was a known tribe somewhere there. So they're like, I wonder where. So there are a bunch of, you know, the, the white collar nerdy types that were going on their field trip to go and maybe make first contact, maybe to learn, right? Because it's, it's interesting. And uh, their plane's flying around and it just gets... And the photograph of his, it is so many arrows sticking out of this plane. They did not, they're, they're not going back <laughs> unless you bring military. And even then probably not bring your tanks. <laughs> um, they're, uh, and it's just, it's a porcupine of arrows. And that's because that civilization is old and has, has had old antagonism and it is just cooked right into the culture to be. Uh, in in some sense militant but this island they're they're just chill dudes uh, and so the plane landed they're like yeah these guys are pretty cool let's let's like eat together let's tr they don't speak the same language or anything but they're still human so they're like like oh brown people and the other guys are like white people and they're like they, so they're kind of like hanging out and the guys they try to trade a little bit and trading is really hard when the concept of trading is kind of, is even absent. There are some interesting tricks to do trading with natives that I had learned a little bit about. And I should, I should go and learn it a little more seriously because it's good if you're, if you're ever a game master playing a tabletop role-playing game and you want to have these interactions, there are ways of, of depositing and making offers and counter offers for doing goods trading when you're uh, not overtly hostile, but you're extremely cautious, your factions, and you don't speak the same language. So you can't sit and negotiate live. So you're like, you, you place stuff and you leave. And then you, you come back and the other party places stuff and they leave. And it's like, it's, it's, I will trade you this for this. And you come back and you're like, well, that's totally unfair. So you take some of your stuff and you move it away and you leave the rest of your stuff. And, and it's like, and you start moving and matching different things, maybe in different piles until you're like, well, okay. And you take their pile and you leave your pile and you, and that happens bit by bit until you have some leftovers that they they don't think is worth anything or they don't have, if they never offered anything that's worth anything, they'll never get your Coke bottle or whatever. Right. And um, there are ways of doing trading like that. But, so maybe they did a bit of this or they just, as I understand, they just gave them a bunch of stuff like junk, whatever the heck they're like, yeah, cool. We'll, we'll give you some of, some of this and this and like ta-ta and they left <laughs> and they didn't come back. <laughs> and uh, cause, cause why there was nothing there. So they didn't care. Um, their company or other people it, it would, at the time it was just not a particularly fascinating place these days boy would it be uh, they're they're probably that story is probably just the story now because they are perhaps they are semi-civilized or however you want to think of it they they there has been significant contact right there are foreigners that speak their language this kind of stuff at any rate when these people left on their magical flying machine um, they were viewed something like gods because they are humans that did these things and had this stuff. And it was outside of their comprehension of reality. Eh, I mean, it, I mean, it's, I guess it's reasonable. Fine. It's, it's weird. It's weird for us to think that other humans could like be that distant. And so what they did, because they wanted them to come back, they wanted to trade some more, they wanted to eat some of the weird food, this kind of stuff. So there were stories and what ended up happening is they ended up making a wooden replica from memory of their uh, plane. <laughs> and, and essentially it became a, a, um, what's the term? An idol in some sense. And they formed a cult culture around the return of these people in that, in that, in that plane. And it just, it persisted until this place was rediscovered later. And this notion, um, became, became coined as the, a cargo cult. 
And I don't know why I wanted to explain that because it took me so long. <laughs> um, wow. What, what were we talking before? <laughs> I'm looking at my... Notes. I completely forgot. I, I completely too. forgot what brought us to that point. Um, I really don't want to remember at this point because it just seems... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's related to noodles. I don't know how. I hope not. <laughs> um, I, I was talking about audio before. Uh, maybe I'll just switch to something else. Um, so I can go on my little Destiny rant for about three minutes. Would you like to? Sure. Well, we'll see how long this will last. But, um, so in this game, there was a somewhat major. I guess it would be a big deal where it's something fresh and nobody has any clue on it and or it's a raid and it was fresh, no one knew what to do and there was a competition out to see who completed it first. Is that official? And, yeah, it's official and uh, Bungie would send out championship belts to the first team that did it. Uh-huh. I wasn't competing for that. There's to see first one to complete it, but first one to complete it in Oh in the first day. They handed out a reward for people who an in game icon for whoever completed within the twenty four hours. And my group, which was with a bunch of randoms, we managed to do it in twelve. Nice. Which wasn't too bad. Uh, I mean, that's within the first day. Yeah. And you don't have a, you were saying you don't have a beta for Destiny 2, so it's not like anybody had any look whatsoever. <laughs> so, yeah. so it's still pretty impressive. Well, assuming so, so you would figure it out sooner. But um, on top of that, there's a, there's a power level system, or yeah, a leveling system where you're behind on you wouldn't deal the amount of damage or they cap. There's a contest modifier, which sets you 20 behind, which doesn't make sense to anybody, but it caps doesn't cap, but you do less damage than what you could. Okay. So it's a hard mode. Yeah. Did you take that chance or was that required? It's required for the first day. Oh, wow. I mean, that doesn't matter so much, does it? Because you've got a limit in how powerful you can be in the first place. Well, after the 24 hours was up, I went back in after waking up and did the did the raid again. And it was just... It was laughable. Yeah, that's kind of a shame. It was like laughable fun. It's like, oh, wow, this was a challenge? Yeah. I mean, you recorded it too, didn't you? I recorded it, but there's... Now I'm going to spend some time just cutting through it. Um, I believe there was a section where I didn't record, or I forgot to hit record, so it's going to be dead space, or empty. Oh, but that I, sucks. Was it just from attempts, or just, was it a kill that you missed? I don't know. I haven't looked at it yet. So my, so when I was recording it, I went into, um, no, I streamed it on my own account. And then decided to, and then decided because I didn't want to see one long file, I separate into chunks, and I forgot to hit the record after stopping. Yeah, that sucks. But you did it. You did it, and you did it twice. I mean, this is the kind of <laughs> I did it three times technically. Wow. Er, I did it the first time. That took twelve hours. The second time it was me and two other people who knew what we were doing, so it wasn't too bad. That took us four hours. And then I did it one more time, but a friend woke me up and asked me to help out somebody else get their clear. Now, on this third time, I could say technically we did it, but it was past the 24-hour mark. We finished 24, hour, 24 hours and one minute. <laughs> so the guy didn't get the emblem. Well, well I mean, he, he did pull you in as a pinch hitter, so technically he doesn't deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> that is the kind of story that'll stick with you forever. <laughs> and now we know what to make improvements and how to make the changes. And this is another lesson learned, but 
I managed to beat it this time, so I was actually happy, as opposed to the one that was held last year. Well, and you got something to show for it. But the thing is, as I had been saying all the way to the lead up of this, I mean, even before Destiny 2, right, is this had presented a a unique opportunity in in space and time for this game, where if you had your stuff together and you streamed right away, then that would have meant something to a lot of people. And if, because you won, if you were really on top of stuff and cut it apart and put up a, a fun success headshot compilation, 10 minutes of headshots or whatever the heck for the new raid. Um, and then you did a, an actual rough guide, the, that would, that alone would be popular. And if you did a better guide, on day two or whatever with some new recordings to just get certain angles better that would be extremely popular you might still have a chance to do that and or again I'm planning on having it all done so from i'm planning on having a video out on whichever section on saturday mm-hmm. i just need to get my teaching down and how to explain things down properly so i can draft it and make it so make it more concrete well, I mean, your what you can, because so seizing the day, so to speak, is your first pass could be going through and roughing out the angles, the the shots, and don't don't be perfect, but make it good to look at. Don't talk at all and just put that up as a preview, and because you want people who are looking for this. Who are like, well, I don't even know what to expect. What does it look like? Where are things at? And people keep talking about this stuff, but I, I, I just want to look at it. I want to see what it's like. And if you have, if, if you're the video that shows that stuff, that's going to matter to a lot of people. So it makes you searchable. And if you're like, this is, this is a rough, I'm going to clean, tighten it up and I'm going to put in some actual explanations as to why you were doing certain things um, and what to think about next, et cetera, et cetera. Cause things are different per class sometimes. And that, that, that will get you subscribers and that'll get a person coming back. And, and so that's, that's like three different kinds of, of ways of approaching the same material. It's, it's your super cut. It's your rough cut with no explanation. And then it's your final with some explanation and you can polish it up and do an, uh, a better release later that, that's really good that's recorded when things got easier this kind of stuff um but this is your only opportunity for this kind of for this for this event so i mean i would like i said i would totally understand that that destiny 2 gets in the way of doing this podcast for example because that's that is an important thing you've been looking for stuff to do in life since forever and <laughs> I haven't even talked about the the absent to do list from you accomplishing a bunch of stuff. So, I mean, you got to find, you've got to drink your own water, horse. It's, it's, you got to figure out how to do this stuff. And the, you've been tinkering at the idea of streaming and editing and stuff like that for long enough that I can actually make something of it, but I just don't. Well, yeah. It's part of it. I mean, at some point it's going to be more fun to actually work on this stuff than it is to play League of Legends. Like you're looking for something else to do. Well, here you go. Um, I know what my barrier is. My barrier is having an audience and having audience participation because there's, there's something called moral support. It's somebody can just give some nice words and it helps and it helps, um, provide meaning. Um, it, it helps me it it gives it gives a little more solidity to um like the promises in a schedule for example when there is a target audience that is expecting that it becomes easier for some people it becomes stressful like they've got judgment on them which which is there as well right but in the earlier days just knowing that there's a little bit of an audience getting a little bit of feedback, participating, this kind of stuff uh, can help motivate a person into, into doing more and more early YouTube used to be a lot like that where 
you just have some nobody YouTuber. They had a potato camera and, you know, 320p. And we didn't even understand audio quality back then. We, we didn't have cartoons, cutscenes, music, any of this. It was just a, somebody in front of a screen and, and they would work on the quality of their content. Now the bar is way higher, but the bar isn't very high when it's brand new content. What you need is just to rush to be the first one there, to be the highest search result, to be the most valued. And then for people to, to be like, okay, well, I, I liked what I saw. I'll give you a chance. Cause, cause there's, there's nothing else. It's just a super cut or it's just a whatever. And then they'll, they'll bookmark and they'll subscribe. They'll comment on a Reddit thread or whatever the heck. And that will tell you that you need to get, get your shit together, that you need to get it done, that you've got a promise that now needs to be fulfilled. And maybe that's what you need to motivate yourself to the, for the next promise and you get a little that will have some momentum you'll get more eyeballs on a preview video and then you come back and you'd be like what's well, going to take me a couple of days to and then maybe you break it down per fight and you'd be like okay well i i can do this real quick and just release that right away and and then and and continue like that and it's kind of trickling it out it's kind of leading leading, stringing people along kind of thing, but it is a lot of work to do video editing, like a lot, a lot. And you get stuck on things like scripting. Don't your, your earlier version should just be you kind of showing stuff. And then later you do the telling part. Um, so yeah, there, there is, there is potential there. There is stuff to be done and you've, you've got, man, like, like I said before, everybody's got quarantine time now, right? So, um, it, it isn't that this is necessarily some new, new revenue stream. Um, never, th this is not an essential service. <laughs> um, don't expect to make a living off of anything. You shouldn't. If you're expecting that, that's really bad. Not necessarily. Some people, if they've got that kind of perspective in mind, um, some people are business oriented and they are able to craft opportunities that would lead to revenue and they understand how to push these things. They're not shy about those, those, those things, those perspectives. And, uh, they will see certain things as springboards for certain other things. So they'll have multiple endeavors and those endeavors, endeavors will link together. And this is one of the things about quote unquote, having like a YouTube having a successful YouTube channel is you, is you have an Instagram and a Twitter and a, and you're participating in all these things. You're trying to bond them together into one brand and get people that bump into you on Twitter to also come to you on YouTube. And, and if you participate on Reddit, you want to bring, and that's a lot of work and there's a lot of marketing mindset in there. And if a person doesn't have that, then their path to success will be partly accident and partly maybe somebody recommends them. And I know some people where they have had interaction with somebody that is uh, respected well enough or popular for, for their own reasons, maybe because they started young, they started when things were little and they grew with the platform where they brought people on board and those other people helped to boost their presence, their channel. Um, and some of that ends up getting loaned because they were valuable enough that the other person brought them on board and, and did a, a one-off video with that person as their expert. So the, the most recent example that I have is, uh, Linus tech tips is, uh, a YouTube, uh, tech channel. They go over uh, hardware, computer hardware stuff. And it's very, very popular, you know, more than a million subs. And they did this video on what happens if you, I, I don't know if there was phone or laptop. I think it was lap. Like what happens if you spill on your laptop, it gets wet. It's this myth of, I think I've, I've got this right. It's a myth of putting rice in it, opening up, putting rice in it to help it dry out. You know, the rice will absorb just like, the, like you're boiling 
or making a peel off or whatever, rice will absorb the water, right? So you throw it on your electronics. It absorbs the excess water that's in the air. And, and, and no, <laughs> that, that isn't just wrong. That is harmful. And so this other dude who had not a whole lot of subscribers made this rant and it, it actually, there's the idea of punching up if you want to get the attention of a big YouTuber. Uh, he wasn't doing that. He's, he's just an electronics guy, this guy, Lewis Rossman. Um, and he was pretty little, but people liked him a lot and he's quality and quality in that amateur sense, but quality in that, like, how does a human figure this stuff out? So he's good at his field, not a good YouTuber, not a good talker, not a good looking man. <laughs> like he's not good to look at, right? He's not, uh, his videos aren't pretty. All right. They're not well presented. They don't sound great. Like but it's quality content. He's good old fashioned hard work kind of thing. And he made a ranty video tearing up that apart. And he's done a, a few of those because there are big names who, who spread mythology for technical stuff. And he corrects things because he's passionate about making sure that people don't do these things, even though it is his job to repair stuff like the things that people are doing. He's like, no, no, I don't, I don't want you to have these problems in the first place. I'll be here if you break your machine, but I would rather not have your business. Honestly, I'd rather fix this problem in the world and be out of a job because that's, that's a better world. Kind of, That's his position on a lot of stuff. And he got noticed and he got brought in for a follow-up video as the expert. Man, was he awkward and terrible in that video. But, but hit the 1 million subscriber plus audience looks at that little channel goes, and that guy knows what he's talking about. And, and, and they, they look at his channel maybe, and they go, well, I'm all subscribed. Like, I didn't know about this stuff that this guy was talking about. I had the wrong idea in mind all this time. And if this 1 million sub guy doesn't know this stuff and this little guy does, Hey, maybe I want to make sure that I'm on top of stuff for this little guy. Cause I like this tech stuff. And I checked this out and it's a little more technical. I, I, didn't, I didn't know I was interested in this stuff. And all these people went to Lewis to his channel and, and stayed <laughs> and stayed and stayed and they recommend it and they talked about it. And that is why his channel became, and now he's over a million subs and because his, he, I kind of disagree with it because I love the indie experience, but he folded in his 20% to improve that experience, improve his equipment, improve his audio, improve how things are positioned, his lighting and the, the character of his content. It's fundamentally the same. Um, but, and, and, and that improvement also folded in that, that can now be seen reflected in his subscriber numbers, for example, and the way things work these days, though, those are more authentic subscribers rather than being bots from the olden days or old stale accounts from people that haven't logged in a long time who subscribed and then left. Um, those are more live cause they're quite recent over the last couple of years. Um, and so in terms of, of breeding success, you can be there and grow with the platform or you can, uh, find ways of marketing oneself, or you can uh, link yourself to certain trends, but you can also be first to talk about something first to correct something be and get, be at the top of the search results. And that will absolutely bring people because if you have no competition and the topic becomes popular, you become popular. So destiny comes out, destiny's got new content comes out that comes out. You're the first one to record stuff. You're the first one to post videos on YouTube. You craft your names and your titles, your descriptions correctly. People go to Google destiny to new raid gameplay and they find you first they click and, and, and you actually show what you said you would. <laughs> And they're like, oh, oh, that's what it's like. Well, that's rather weird. They subscribe and you, you make a thing at the end that goes, Hey, this is just rough. I'm going to be doing more 
or you do that at the beginning, you have a little thing in the middle, whatever the heck you talk about yourself, you will upsell, you tell people to subscribe, ring the bell and all this kind of stuff. Leave a comment. Let me know how you think I should improve. Do you think I, is there a better strategy? I'm going to come out with another video next week and they'll subscribe. And you do that again next week. And you, you, for the things that people are, then you say destiny Two new rate strategy. Um, and then you bring out another video, top of the search results. Why? Because you're building on top of the success of the first one. YouTube will know it's successful. We'll now recommend for the, and, and so on and so forth. And there's a snowball momentum that happens from those early decisions, just because you got there first. Uh, not because you're highest quality, because you got there first. And then you work on your quality after. Uh, that's the end of our show. <laughs> Minion, if you have a follow-up, you can, before we end. I got nothing. You, Of course you have nothing. <laughs> but I do, I at some point, I want you to be so successful and so proud that you can start talking about that work on this show, because it's, some, it's a part of your life. It's something that, if you talk about it, it makes it more real, and it gives you more... Um, more pride in, in a positive sense <laughs> and talking about something will have the, even if it isn't, isn't direct. When you talk about something, your imaginary audience starts holding you accountable for the promises that you make, right? So even if there are not people talking to you about these things, saying it out loud will tend to motivate and we need to discover something like this for you more than, so, I mean, talking about it, talking about how much you've done, how much you want to do, what you've, what you're learning might help. It's, it's part of why I talk about this podcast while we're in the podcast. It is motivating. So anyhow, we're going to be back. Um, we're going to be back on Wednesday. I still want to make this a regular show, even though Manian is playing destiny two and I'm playing world of Warcraft. I'm playing it really hard, but this is a, a good break. Um, if one takes too long of a break from stuff, which is something I wanted to talk about in second segment, if you take too much of a break, um, you lose something of the soul of what motivated you, but it's not just motivation. It's memory. It's how to use all the nuances of all your equipment, all your software. It's, there's a whole lot of stuff that just kind of erodes. And so you need to be on top. This is why Minion, you should be paying 15 minutes of attention to the podcast every day without pause to try and maybe do a little bit. And if, if you've got some project and you put it down for too long, you may never put it back, pick it back up again. Well, why, why should you? Cause it obviously, it obviously didn't matter if you put it down for so long. Yeah. Like, Let's not talk about the book that I should be working on. Anyhow, I will see you guys again on Wednesday. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.